Like countless people down through the generations, we have been trying in these Sunday evenings to discover the glorious message of the letter of Paul to the Romans. And we are at present in chapter 2, in that part of the letter, which is undoubtedly the most difficult for us in many ways to receive. It is certainly not the most difficult to understand, but it is one of these passages which speaks to us about unpopular subjects. In 1941, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, whom many of you will know about, and you may have read some of his books, wrote what I rather think was his first published book. It was entitled, The Plight of Man and the Power of God. I think it has been out of print for a long time, although it may now be reprinted. It was a series of addresses that he gave at the Free Church College in Edinburgh and was largely on the opening chapters of the Epistle to the Romans, or selected parts of them anyway. And part of his emphasis at this particular juncture that we are at this evening was that you really had to discover what was the real plight of man before you would be able to discover the real glory of the power of God in the gospel. Being himself a distinguished physician before he entered the ministry, Dr. Lloyd-Jones uses the illustration of how no competent physician would ever start applying a cure until he had undertaken the most thoroughgoing diagnosis. And clearly that is what Paul is doing in this whole section of the letter to the Romans. Two Sunday evenings ago we listened to him unfolding to us the truth of the wrath of God against all ungodliness and unrighteousness or against the godlessness and wickedness of men, as the NIV puts it. This evening, in chapter 2 of Romans, we are coming to the closely related subject of the judgment of God. You are bound to have noticed in our reading that that is the recurring theme that runs right the whole way through Romans chapter 2. The two themes of the wrath of God and the judgment of God are not just related in terms of theology, they are related in the way Paul speaks of them in verse 5 of chapter 2, for example. He speaks of the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. That will be the day, in other words, when God's stored up anger against sin will be poured out. And that is what the day of judgment is. Now the fact of a coming day of judgment at the end of this age is an integral element in the gospel that Paul preaches. Do you notice, for instance, did you pick it up in verse 16, that when he is describing what this judgment is and in what context it is to be understood, he says this will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Christ Jesus as my gospel declares. Now what Paul is saying is, just as in the revelation of God's truth in the gospel, you have all the wonder of the teaching of God's love and grace and boundless mercy to sinners. The gospel itself 
not a preliminary to the gospel, but the gospel itself speaks to us about that day when God will judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. I think the whole concept of judgment in Scripture is presented to us as a necessity for two basic reasons. It is an essential truth, first of all, for the sake of the moral integrity of God. And the doctrine of judgment brings us to see clearly that God is a God of moral integrity, that is, that he is not complacent about sin. Now that may sound all very complex and doctrinaire, but let me image that you often hear people using. People will say very often when some tragedy or some evil or some dreadful thing happens in the world, why does God allow this to happen? I heard somebody say it at a recent murder of that young boy who was a trainee manager in Woolworths. Someone said, why does God allow this to happen? Now, what they are pleading for is this, you see. Is God complacent about that kind of wickedness? Does God not care about sin and rebellion and murder and rape and license of every kind? Well, now, what Scripture tells us is God does. And God's moral judgment of sin is a reality that lies at the very heart of the universe. And it is not only his purpose, but his promise that God will judge the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Why do they get off, people say? Well, of course, the simple answer is they do not. The fact that God does not send in his account the day afterwards does not mean that it's not coming. And that is one of the reasons that judgment is an essential element. It preserves the moral integrity of God. The other reason, I think, is that it preserves the moral foundation of the universe. There is a sense in which the whole of the universe would begin to disintegrate if there was no moral foundation for it. And the apostle is teaching us about this doctrine of God's judgment here, relating it particularly to three things. And you will be able to follow this fairly simply because they are in a sense, in three paragraphs. He relates it, first of all, to human behavior in verses 1 to 11. In verses 12 to 16, Paul relates judgment to God's law. And in verses 17 to 29, he relates judgment to the whole realm of religious privilege. So human behavior, divine law, and religious privilege are the three areas to which Paul relates this teaching on judgment. How then, first of all, in verses 1 to 11, does Paul relate the judgment of God to human behavior? You will, if I may pause to say so, recognize that I am um, crunching rather than sucking the truth of this chapter. You will know we almost have a settled vocabulary for spending a long time over a little part of Scripture that's sucking it and crunching it is going through it very quickly. And that's what I'm going to be doing this evening. So you will need to fill in uh, the areas that need to be elaborated at home yourself. 
There are a number of excellent commentaries on Romans that some of you may have. John Stott has recently written one. Leon Morris has written another, which is also excellent. There is a particularly good, short, simple commentary on Romans, and which is written by Stuart Olliot and uh, published, I think, by Evangelical Press. And that's something well worth getting. Uh, that's the commercial, and now to continue. What Paul's train of thought is you can follow fairly easily, I think, if you look from the end of chapter 1 into the beginning of chapter 2. At the end of chapter 1, he has been describing the appalling situation of man in sin who, although he knows God's righteousness, this is the last verse of chapter 1, although he knows God's righteous decree that those who do such things as he has been describing deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, what adds insult to injury in the catalogue at the end of chapter 1 of human sin is that people look at it, see it, and then approve it. That is the ultimate twist in fallen human nature, that we do not see it, find ourselves appalled by it, and reject it. We approve of it. Now you don't need to look further than the average television program to s today to see that people not only approve of that whole catalogue of sin, they gloat over it. They advertise it. They delight in it. They advocate it for other people and spurn those who do reject it. So Paul is describing at the end of chapter 1 those who approve of the sin that he has just said comes under the wrath of God. But at the beginning of chapter 2, he turns to those who disapprove of it. They may have imagined that simply to disapprove of sin will be sufficient for God. And he turns to them, You therefore have no excuse who pass judgment on someone else. But at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself. Now, here is a situation where people actually look upon this moral disorder. And they say, this is preposterous and horrid and something that we want to call down the judgment of God upon. It is extreme disapproval that Paul is speaking about. But when Paul begins to address this particular person and most people think that he is addressing not only the morally upright generally, he is addressing the morally upright Jew in particular and comes more especially to do so later on in the chapter. But what he is saying to them is that when they disapprove with their lips or even with a superficial attitude, but in fact, in the secret places of their life, live exactly the same way, then he says, you too have no excuse. You too will come under the judgment of God. Notice how frequently he points out the essential element of human behavior in the question of God's judgment. In verse 2 he says, You are condemned yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Now listen to the repetition of that phrase, doing the same thing. Verse 2, Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. 
So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? Now, do you see the two things that are at fault in this morally upright person? In the first place, they show verbal judgment. They have an attitude which is ready to cast every kind of criticism upon those who are described at the end of chapter 1. But he says, in the secret of your own life, you are actually doing the same thing. And then he adds something that's of great importance. And even though in the secret You are getting off with it just now. You have misunderstood another thing. You have misunderstood that God does not just want outward verbal criticism and judgment. You have misunderstood also that God's failure to put his hand upon your life and stop you in what you're doing and judge you immediately is not a sign of divine weakness. It is a sign of divine patience. We have many of us known the reality of that, haven't we? Very easy for us to be violently, verbally critical of other people. And yet in our own hearts, there are exactly the same things. And we may say to ourselves in an odd secret moment, well, God hasn't done anything about it. All this talk about judgment hasn't happened to me. Now, God is neither complacent nor weak nor untrue to his word. His patience has only one purpose, and that is to lead you to genuine heart felt repentance and change of life before his judgment comes. That's what Paul means when he says, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? And that kind of hypocrisy, Paul says, is something that God ultimately will judge because he judges not our image but our secrets. Verse 16, this will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets by Christ Jesus. I need to say to you very clearly this evening that what God judges, and this is one of the great themes of this chapter, is our behavior, our works, our practices, not our profession, not our reputation, not the image we have amongst other people or even other Christians. It is our behavior that God judges. It is our actions which are at the heart of his judgment. Now look at verses 4 and 5 and imagine a man who, seeing no sign of judgment, concludes that God is soft and goes on in his sin without repentance. The apostle says, Because of your stubbornness, verse 5, and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. And then he states to us in verse 6 what is really the text for this whole truth that God judges according to our works or behavior. In verse 6, 
he says, God will give to each person according to what he has done. Now, the truth that judgment is based on behavior, that is, on our outward works, on what we have done in this world, is one that goes all the way through Scripture. You might imagine that it was something that was found only in the Old Testament, not true. It is found in the Old Testament, and Paul is quoting here from Proverbs 24, 12 but you also find it in the teaching of Jesus. Let me read to you Matthew 16:27. This is Jesus speaking about judgment. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Notice that's from the lips of Jesus. Judgment is according to what we have done. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon, says the risen and enthroned Christ. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. So you will notice in verses 8 and 9, for example, that those who practice evil will receive the wrath of God. For those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Now, if you look at verses 7 and 10, and imagine an entirely different kind of person who seeks and does exclusively what is good and lives for the glory of God and covets his honor alone, notice what Paul says about him in verse 7. For example, to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. And in verse 10, glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. That is, God has no partiality. And his standard of judgment is this, that he judges according to what we have done here in the flesh. Now you may say, is this a denial of the doctrine that we are justified by faith in Jesus Christ not by the works that we have done, not at all. We are justified only by faith in Jesus Christ, not by the works that we have done. But our judgment, the Bible tells us, is according to the works that we have performed. This is why James, when he is expounding this whole question, says to us, Show me your faith. Now, it's not a profession of faith, you see. He says, show me your faith. How do you show it to me? By your works. And this is a significant and important thing. Look again at verse 7. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory and honor, that is for God, and immortality, he will give eternal life. That is a promise of God, and God means it. You find it re-echoed when he gives the law of God. Those who keep the law, he says, will live. They will have eternal life. But there is, of course, one great problem. 
you are not a person like that. You do not live for what is good. Your life is not integrated by a sole desire for the glory of God and for the honor of his name, is it? Neither is mine. Neither has been any man or woman in the world apart from Jesus Christ who has lived that kind of life. Now, do you see the point that judgment from God is according to the works that we have done? We are aware that when God says to us when he gives his law, do this and you shall live, there is not one of us in the universe who can obey the law of God. We have everyone turned to his own way. We have everyone gone after our own will. And God's judgment is according to our works. What is it then that drives us to Jesus Christ? I'll tell you. It is the testimony against us of a broken law. It is having to come to say to him, it is not finished, Lord, There is not one thing done. There is no battle of my life that I have really won. And now I come to tell thee how I fought to fail my human, all too human tale of weakness and futility. We come to God and say, I cannot live like this. I am under God's moral judgment. And then... He leads us by the hand to Jesus Christ and shows us in Him the perfect answer to our sin and failure. But this is the judgment of God. And it's an immensely important thing for us to grasp it. That leads me to the second thing. Let me speak to you about it briefly from verse 12 to verse 16 how God's judgment relates to the law of God. Something like ten times in these five verses, Paul refers to the law. He is, of course, referring to the Ten Commandments, the moral law which God gave to his people as the standard by which they were to live. Now, it's not difficult to see that the Jews had the law of God. Verse 12, all who sin apart from the law will perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. Now, those who are under the law are the Jews. God gave them the law and told them this was his standard for living. Those who are apart from the law are the Gentiles. But notice again, God has no favorites. God is not a respecter of persons. And those who are apart from the law and those who are under the law are in the same condition except when you come to verse 17 and see the question about privilege, religious privilege. But I say it's not so easy to understand why the Gentiles are in the same sense judged by the law. Let me try to explain that briefly to you. Paul says in verse 15 that the requirements of the law are written on the hearts of the Gentiles, their consciences bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Now, what he is speaking about is something very similar to what he spoke to us about in chapter 1 where he told us that the condition of the pagan is not that he knows nothing whatever about God and needs to come to know something about God. The condition of the pagan, chapter 1 tells us, is that although, this is verse 21, although they knew God, They glorified him not as God, neither gave thanks to him. The problem of pagan man 
is that God has given him a revelation of himself in the created order. And he has suppressed that knowledge. He has dismissed the knowledge that God does give him in the creation. In the same sense here in verse 15 of chapter 2, he says God has given to us a knowledge of his law in the conscience. Now, you can demonstrate that by going to all kinds of remote places of the world, as missionary friends of mine have told me, where Jesus Christ's name has never been preached. But you will find people who resent the idea of their wife being taken away by a stranger. They know that they ought not to kill. They are aware that what is theirs should not be thieved by somebody else. What is this? That's several of the Ten Commandments written into their conscience. And this is what Paul is speaking about. He says in verse 15... Even although, verse 14, indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves. That is, when they do uh, refrain from stealing and so on, they are a law for themselves, even although they do not have the law. Since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. Very interesting thing. My friend Graham Miller from New Zealand worked amongst the most primitive tribe in the New Hebrides before he came back to his native New Zealand. And I remember him telling me how there was a reality of guilt when people did something that broke the moral law even in such a place where Christ had never been known. Now in that sense, the apostle is saying to us, the vital thing is not having the law, either on tablets of stone or in your heart, or hearing the law, it is heeding and obeying it. Both Jew and Gentile have the law in different ways, and both have broken it and been brought under the judgment of God. Let me just tell you one place where this is very important. It's very important not to say what I judge to be the unbiblical thing that many people often say. The only thing you will be judged for by God is rejecting Jesus Christ. You ever heard people say that? Maybe you thought it was true. What I want to say to you this evening is that is not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches here and throughout the Scriptures consistently is that God judges men and women by the deeds that they have done. Of course, you see, if God did not judge people for anything else than rejecting Jesus Christ, maybe the kindest thing you could do to the pagan is not to go and tell him about Jesus Christ. Isn't that true? The relation of judgment to privilege. That's verses 17 to 29. Paul now quite specifically addresses the Jew of his own day. If you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you're instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of the knowledge of truth, he says, this puts you in a privileged position. These Jews had been so well instructed. 
they had been so well blessed by God with every possible kind of privilege and favor. Now listen to what he says. He says it's not privilege. Privilege doesn't bring you to be excused from the judgment of God. Privilege brings you responsibility which may make your judgment more severe. Listen to this, verse 21. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples, which seems to have been something that the Jews of this period were liable to do? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. He is simply saying, you see, that privilege does not insulate you from the judgment of God. Because God's standard of judgment is our actions, not our profession. Do you see? And therefore, he says things like circumcision are of no advantage to you because they are merely outward unless you have something in the heart which mirrors what circumcision speaks about. Now you see what Paul is saying. He has, in other words, spoken to the morally upright person and said to them, the great problem is that your morality is not enough to please God and meet his standard. Your inner man is as corrupt as the Gentiles. He then comes on to the question of the law of God, possessing it, knowing it, teaching it, is not enough. It's obeying it that matters. And he comes to the Jew and says, all the privileges that you have, they will not insulate you from the judgment of God. They may, because you have been so privileged and favored, make your judgment more severe. Now, my friends, we are a very privileged people, most of us. I have had the enormous privilege during my life of being brought almost immediately after I was converted into a biblical ministry and brought under a godly supervision and care and pastoral concern. I have had the privilege of seeing in the lives of other people the grace of God at work modeling everything that I dreamed of being. And you have been privileged too in so many ways. I tell you, you will never be able to say when it comes to the judgment day, ah, but I was taught in the navigators, or I was in the CU and president of the Christian Union. I had the privileges of being here and there and knowing this and that one. Did you not realize that I was an elder? And God will say, your privileges only serve to make your responsibility greater. The thing that really matters is, have you discovered your plight? And has it driven you to the great physician? That's what matters. As a humble, broken, needy sinner. For that's what this chapter is intended to do. Not to make us depressed or downcast. But to say, Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Saviour, or I die.
Now the doctrine of the judgment of God will drive a man or woman there. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we tremble before your truth and acknowledge how it removes every hiding place in which we may seek to run from you. In your great mercy, drive us to Jesus that we may find in him all our souls need. We bless you that as condemned sinners, condemned by a broken law and by a holy God, we may come to him in whom there is therefore now no condemnation, even Jesus Christ our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.